If I could have everybody's attention, um, if you're here for the session entitled The Role of Open Access Education in Combating Diabetes and Pre-Diabetes, um, you'll notice there are six or seven handouts um, to the table that I'm uh, motioning towards that you can come up and grab those um, handouts and we'll be discussing some, some of them during the presentation. Um, but if you have intended to attend this session, I appreciate um, your attendance and I hope that you'll get something out of this. Um, and so with that, let's kind of begin the presentation. So I am the executive director of Diabetes Education for All. It is a health-based nonprofit foundation focused on diabetes specifically. We are um, we're focused on creating awareness around mitigation strategies in combating diabetes, as well as creating communities of practice specifically in low-income regions of the world where there are less equity, there's less equity in terms of access to insulin and other resources. Um, some of the, the basic objectives for today. Our first objective is to delve into the current ten trends in diabetes prevalence by examining the present landscape, um, as well as hi highlighting the urgency for, pro for proactive intervention and prevention strategies. We'll be looking at some of, the strat some of the statistics that explore and emphasize the pressing need for action. And finally, we'll discuss the role of open access education which is kind of the common theme for the, for, for the general conference um, in terms of the form of education has as a proven instrument, um, not only in preventing diabetes, but also effectively managing it. Um, we'll delve into why this approach is so impactful in empowering individuals and communities. So let's... Let's, uh, let's, let's start at the very basic bare bones, right? What is diabetes and prediabetes? Well, diabetes, it, it's a chronic condition marked by consistently high levels of glucose in the blood. This condition arises when the body, body struggles to regulate the blood sugar levels effectively. Prediabetes, on the other hand, is a precursor stage to diabetes. Individuals with prediabetes have elevated blood sugar levels, but they haven't yet reached the threshold that would identify a diagnosis of having diabetes. So this stage serves as a, as a very critical, crucial warning sign. Some of the very basic risk factors for diabetes are genetic predisposition, sedentary lifestyle, poor dietary habits, obesity, socioeconomic factors, and access to healthcare. And you can kind of see through some of those that I've mentioned that there'd be a much greater impact in terms of low income regions of the world and where access um, to basic technology and information is lacking. The impact of diabetes and prediabetes. So there's a profound impact that diabetes and prediabetes have on individuals and society at large. First, in terms of health consequences, these conditions can lead to a range of serious uh, complications, including heart disease, chronic kidney, kidney disease, and vision loss. The economic burden is also very substantial. The economic burden is emphasized based on um, based on kind of the importance of, in, of investing in prevention and prevention measures and education, such that um, there isn't a, a uh, out, out, outweighing kind of impact on society at large um, and act in general access to healthcare based on being able to prevent um, conditions that are if caught at an early stage. Finally, there's a notable social impact. So individuals dealing with diabetes often experience a reduced quality of life. Moreover, it can place a significant burden on families and support networks. This highlights the need for community-wide initiatives and support systems. And we'll talk a little bit about this when we talk about communities of practice. Here we have a number of statistics 
Um, so in this section, you'll see, and I won't go through all of them, obviously, um, you'll, you can kind of see through a closer look at, at diabetes statistics from the year 2021 um, when these figures were compiled. Um, this is a snapshot that serves as a foundation of the pressing and critical need to address diabetes. And as we just discussed on the prior slide, how um, the prevalence of diabetes um, has, has a, is, a, is a leading factor to a lot of other uh, body-based um, illnesses um, to the heart, kidney, and so on. Communities of practice. So a community of practice, as, it's, as you can see on, on the slide, is a group of people for, that form a common profession, come from a common profession of interest area, and share a knowledge and experiences with each other such that they can improve the professional goals um, and generally live a better lifestyle through sharing of information and general collaborative spirit. So um, some one, one of the most in things that I think are instrumental about communities of practice is it's fostering a, a culture of continuous learning and growth um, by leveraging the collective wisdom of the group. No one person is more important than the other. Everybody has something to share. And the more that you foster these communities of practice, the more information and access to um, resources is, is increased and serves as a societal benefit. So why is DIFA's work so important? Well, this slide, in, in my view, encapsulates the, encapsulates the crucial reasons why the work of DIFA holds immense significance in the realm of diabetes management and education. Firstly, it's about democratizing education and capacity building tools. This is through open access, um, you know, not, nothing behind a paywall, nothing about, you know, nothing being charged. This is about having access to life-saving strategies and information and tools to be able to implement on your, on your everyday lives and to be able to assist those that are taking care, um, our caregivers um, or healthcare professionals, so those that are living with diabetes or pre-diabetes. DIFA also endeavors to create a diabetes-specific community of practice. Um, these communities of practice that we discussed are collaborative spaces where stakeholders come together. Um, one of our main focus areas, if not our most um, important one is our focus on low-income regions of the world and especially humanitarian settings. Um, on our website, we, um, we work with a lot of different organizations, which we'll kind of highlight a little later on, to be able to provide switching guides in multiple, multiple languages and um, across technological um, competencies and various internet um, access levels. This is the DIFA portal. So um, just touching on a couple of the very basic things, um, you'll see a, a group of, of courses that you can toggle through that are online learning. There are learning communities that really incentivize what we've discussed with communities of practice, um, CME credits, private groups, video conferencing, multi multilingual content, um, very um, mobile app, uh, mobile, mobile, um, mobile friendly, and various kind of bat bandwidths that would you know. So if you're on a lower internet connection, it'll 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 adjust for your specific speed. So mitigating the risk. Uh, the rise of diabetes. So this slide is really pivotal pivotal in understanding how we can collectively work together towards mitigating the rise of diabetes. Some of these early, some of these strategies are early detection and inter intervention. This is the first step in really encouraging regular checkups and screenings. This proactive approach allows for early identification of potential issues and can assist obviously in um, kind of being a blunt, blunting force to those that have prediabetes from developing diabetes and for those to go into that prediabetes range. Um, secondly, um, we have promoting a healthier lifestyle. So this is a cornerstone in diabetes prevention, and it's the adoption of healthier lifestyles, which involves not only promoting 
balanced diets, but also advocating for regular pro physical activity. And finally, community workshops and webinars. You'll see kind of a pattern through some of the stuff we've been talking about, communities that practice, collaboration, um, basically communities where people can share information and resources and, and be able to improve the collective lives of, of those individuals. Open access education. So this slide highlights the critical concept of open access education in the context of diabetes and prediabetes. As a very basic definition, open access education refers to the provision of education materials and resources without any associated cost or restriction. This means that anyone, regardless of financial or social circumstances, can access these resources freely. This inclusivity is really key in ensuring the vital information is available to all. Um, importance. So this is the significance of open access education, which cannot be overstated. It empowers individuals with the knowledge and skills in order to provide self-care as well as prevention and care for others that may, um, may be lacking in information or wherewithal. Accessibility. Open access education is made, for, made available through various channels. This also includes online platforms, which offer a wealth of resources at one's fingertips. And finally, preventative measures um, and those benefits that can be gleaned from them. Uh, one of the most crucial benefits of open access education is its role in preventing, um, preventing um, certain um, diseases and other uh, risk factors that can arise. What are the benefits of open access education? Well, um, empowering in, in patients. This open access education uh, provides patients with essential tools as well as um, knowledge about diabetes risk factors, enabling them to be proactive in managing their own health and uh, ultimately serving as a tool of self-empowerment. Raising awareness. So, this is the potential to be able to reach diverse populations with critical information in a very time-sensitive manner. Um, we see this with a lot of humanitarian settings that are ongoing now across the world, ensuring that even though there is maybe um, a lack of resources, there are different mitigation strategies that can be um, provided to at least make one's situation a little better if, if those, people, those are individuals that are dealing with prediabetes or diabetes. And finally, community engagement. So through open access education, um, we have the opportunity to foster a culture of health and support um, within communities that encourages individuals to come together. So what are some examples of open access resources? Uh, I won't go too much into this. Obviously, you have websites, web-based platforms, DIFA being one of them, access to expert articles and webinars, mobile applications, uh, blood sugar monitoring. This basically is kind of a means to be able to provide, um, to provide resources, information, and in, in all uh, facet of, of learning styles for individuals and, and comfortability, comfortability levels. So this, this is a means to um, impact all, all types of individuals and how they like to consume information. DIFA's future approach. So this slide gives us a glimpse into the future approach of DIFA. DIFA is only um, roughly three years old. Um, and, and so this is centered around the future state mapping, which involves envisioning the future impact um, of our initiatives, looking towards some of the case studies that will illustrate and provide potential um, positive outcomes. This is basically um, funding and providing support to individuals and communities that provide benefit um, to one another to provide open access education and sharing of information that may not be um, in the mainstream, but can, can kind of, through sharing of information, be able to identify what is best for different communities and different regions of the world based on access to resources. Lowered A1C levels through online diabetes management tools, similar to technology, information is also extremely key in being able to um, inform individuals to be able to provide some self-care and understand how their diabetes impacts them specifically. Everybody's body is a little bit differently, uh, at, um, functions differently. 
Um, and finally, reduce diabetes incidence through open access workshops and community initiatives. What are some challenges and solutions? Well, there are language barriers, right? And to address that challenge, we have multilingual resources that are available. Um, secondly, technological access, being able to provide um, and fund community computer centers where individuals maybe aren't uh, of a certain uh, socioeconomic status to have a computer in their home. And um, obviously, some, a lot of this doesn't apply to us in the Western world. A lot of this is kind of speaking to the low-income regions of the world. And uh, combating misinformation through fact-checking resources and, and different resources such as that that are vetted um, by experts. So how do we address specific populations that are of greatest need? Well, obviously, the, um, some of the most at risk um, in, in the current society are children and adolescents. And so it's crucial to engage young individuals in diabetes education early on so they can develop good and healthy eating habits and kind of general uh, healthy lifestyle so they can maintain that and move forward. And, and so the incidence of diabetes will not proliferate as it has over the last you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, underserved communities, recognizing the unique challenges faced by underserved communities, such as um, maybe low-income um, cities, low-income regions of the world that are considered, in, in many ways, um, food deserts and don't have a lot of options. Um, being able to um, provide resourcing to that, as well as being able to be able to mitigate some of that through some creative um, strat strategies. And by addressing these specific populations with tailored approaches, we really, we really look to make a meaningful impact in preventing and managing diabetes among children, children and other um, really at-risk groups um, in, in not only the U.S., but around the world. The future of open access education and diabetes. You know, I'm sure you've seen a lot of the, some of this similar stuff through other other presentations that aren't necessarily focused on health or diabetes, but a lot of these thing, a lot of these uh, factors, um, they emanate throughout throughout the different concepts. So, um, this slide really points to the promising future of open access education in the field of diabetes. Firstly, amongst the potential for growth with advancements in technology and potential for strategic community partnerships being able to reach out to open access education uh, via ed open access education, we can expand exponentially and embrace kind of digital platforms and, and make uh, and really democratize information ultimately. Research and innovation. You know, um, I am, uh, this year and uh, this past, uh, this, this year in June, there's a scientific sessions for the American Diabetes Association. And it's really um, heartening to see all the new innovative research that's being done out there that, that is done um, in a very thoughtful manner that ultimately bring about um, new uh, health trials, uh, clinical trials, and new drugs and technology that um, have, a, have, a, have a massive impact. Um, and finally, professionalized paths to progress, establishing high-level collaborations with shared standards and resources. You can kind of see this if some of you are... are um, familiar with the American Diabetes Association, the, every year they create the standards of care um, and, and they update that on, the, on a biannual basis and targets and ranges are updated and it's really helpful to really um, have a vetted source with, um, that brings together endocrinologists, um, nurse practitioners, all kinds of profession, health professionals and researchers to pr provide the best information possible um, that can be implemented amongst um, everyday um, general, um, general doctors that, that provide services to um, people living with diabetes. Policy recommendations. Well, obviously, um, a lot of these are very standard and kind of um, self-explanatory funding for open access initiatives. When you find something that works, it's important to foster kind of um, to, to be able to grow grow those things that are really having a positive impact, and that's 
part of um, really funding um, open access initiatives. Integration into health care systems, the collaboration between healthcare providers and educational institutions is really essential. It's the integration that ensures that education about diabetes is seamlessly woven into broader healthcare frameworks. So if you go to, uh, for a general checkup, um, you'll get information about diabetes and things that, um, that may, may be leading, um, leading information that can help you make healthier lifestyle decisions. And generally, um, public awareness campaigns, which um, can, can be, can be uh, fostered through any number of mediums. So what are DIFA's contributions? Well, we are a young um, organization, um, but we're really thoughtful about kind of uh, the type of work we'd like to take on and the priorities that we, that we try to foster. So the first real uh, big pillar is general awareness of diabetes. And so this is <clears throat> actively involved in raising general awareness um, through various creation of, of information, um, partnerships with other organizations like Insulin for All, um, the uh, Diabetes Disaster Res Re uh, Response Coalition, IATA, and so on and so forth. Um, these resources are really thoughtfully designed for healthcare providers um, and, and also tailored to the individuals that are going to be using them. Obviously, if you're creating something for individuals that are managing their diabetes on their own, um, that don't necessarily have a health background, you want to be a little bit um, more kind about how you relate that information so that that information isn't a steep learning curve. Um, DIFAs, community groups, and communities of practice. So these are platforms that serve as valuable spaces that, that, that's such where we don't need to have intermediaries or kind of uh, quote unquote experts to uh, mediate um, discussions and so on and so forth. There can be a, a share, you know, a general kind of free uh, free will to share kind of information that that's that's known. Um, and finally, uh, creation of kind of homelessness resources. The homeless population, not only in the U.S. but around the world, um, they they suffer from a lot of um, diseases, illnesses that are easily preventable, and it's about really finding ways in a very um, intuitive fashion to give them the information, resourcing, um, knowledge to be able to, as best as possible um, in their tough situation, to provide care for themselves and help others in their same situation and hopefully um, transition um, um, out of that situation. Um, conflicts and natural disasters. So this slide really highlights the commendable efforts um, of DIFA in responding to conflicts and natural disasters, particularly in low-income regions and settings of the world. So let's examine kind of some, some of these contributions. So there's partnerships, as I mentioned, for disaster response um, with the Diabetes Disaster Response Coalition, which is made up of um, four groups, including um, DIFA, and we create um, and update switching guides um, and, and humanitarian conflicts and be able to provide that in multiple, multiple languages and really make, make information and access to resources as um, prevalent as possible. And Insulin for All, for all to kind of highlight them, they, on a, on a yearly basis, they have uh, at least 300 huge shipments of insulin um, free of charge that they, that they send to hurricane regions, um, humanitarian settings around the world, and they're doing a lot of great work um, currently, um, whether it's the floods in Libya or the, her the earthquake in Turkey and so on. And finally, um, kind of uh, outreach to, uh, to healthcare workers and affected individuals, really being able to identify those individuals in tough situations that need the most assistance so that, such that they can be able to um, to support individuals that look up to them and seek information and make and, and make it a little easier for them to serve larger kind of groups of people um, where it's really not as um, convenient to do one-on-one -on -one kind of work. So here we have um, the Diabetes 360 Guide. And you guys came up to the table, and even if you want to afterwards, this is a, 
um, three by five note card. There's a QR code that takes you directly to our website. Um, if you wanna show that, if that's possible. Um, it'll take you directly here. You'll see the different topics that are covered um, within this. This is a 137 slide document that really goes into every conceivable aspect of diabetes and it covers it from complex, uh, from a high, high complexity to a very basic knowledge. Um, a lot, the basis of this, if, we, if you scroll through, these are, these are resources that are meant for doctors to be able to provide to their patients on general um, regular checkups. It's for clinics and other large institutions to be able to blow them up as posters. Um, and this is all vetted and consistent with the 2023 um, American Diabetes Association standards of care for diabetes. Um, we're always updating this, um, uh, which you'll notice um, in general education, if you go to a lot of resources, there couldn't be good content, but if it's not demonstrated and displayed in a very intuitive and aesthetic fashion, we lose interest, right? And so this is a way to provide that, that education in a way that is um, really, really helpful. So I really hope, um, this is kind of very new, hope you guys will kind of access this, especially if you have any individuals you care about um, that deal with diabetes. Um, and this is just a really, um, you know, something I think we're really proud of and something that we hope to be able to co-brand with other organizations in the future. So with that, um, I think we have a few minutes left. Um, we have um, general questions and discussion. I hope I didn't speak too much, but uh, if there are any questions or even just comments, um, experiences that some of you guys may have with diabetes or your thoughts on it or, um, or any comments on the presentation, please feel free. I guess that means that I, I did a pretty good job. Yeah, let's, um, finally, the last slide as we have, um, let me see, I think, I think there's one. Um, no, that's okay. Oh. Just big thank you, 53 years, type one diabetic. <laughs> Still learning to take care of myself. Um, so great to see open education and, um, uh, I also, I'm curious, I, I follow mildly some of the open source solutions that people have found to sort of create like the closed glucose monitoring systems and it's just a fabulous statement about what, what is possible and also um, really some of the greatest support came from online communities um, where people just so freely give and share not only knowledge and information, I've had people send me things that I can't get where I live right now. So um, this is a wonderful component to add to this mix. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think um, there's one thing I would add to that. I think there's almost a multi-tiered approach to this. There's so much technology, so much information out there. Sometimes we don't know what to what to cover. Um, um, various organizations, the World Health Organization, a ADA, other groups are really doing a, a great job of trying to synthesize the best of the best. Um, and I think um, amongst a lot of the kind of national organizations, the ADA, ADA does a great job, and um, we're actually uh, founded, um, our chairwoman, Noha El Sayed, she is a kind of a very esteemed Harvard endocrinologist, and she's the chairwoman of DIFA, uh, but she's also the vice president of healthcare improvement for the ADA, and she's kind of at the forefront of all the standards development and so on, so she's really, really a great help to really allow DIFA to be at the forefront of a lot of these, these things. But I really appreciate your comments and, and, and kudos to you for kind of managing your diabetes so well. I won't mention the price gouging of insulin that goes on in the world. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, thank you so much for this great presentation. I am a parent of a daughter with type one. And uh, in light of price gouging of insulin and your focus on children and adolescents, I'm really curious if your materials focus on helping youth and adolescents especially see their role in power in shaping what governments do um, to support research and innovation and also to make tech available. 
So I'm curious if there's an organizational change component in your materials. I'm also curious if in the a diabetes education uh, curriculum that you're offering, if you're clear about how insulin was developed and how it was originally intended to not carry copyright. Um, so just like both questions, organizational change and then sharing a history that really shines a light on how insulin was intended to be shared. Yeah. I would say organizational change is really the next frontier that, that has yet to be um, developed because there have been a lot of organizations that, as I mentioned, you know, that don't have a focus on open access. And that's kind of why we continue to say, it, you know, so people want to gatekeep information, courses, so on and so forth. None of this is proprietary. Um, and it's, it's just, it's a, you know, the more that we share, the more that we have a democratization of this information, the courses, um, and for people to feel free, especially children, to kind of speak about what their exp uh, experience is, the more it can help the general broader community. And that's really encompassed in communities of practice. In terms of insulin, yeah, that, you know, that is a very, um, um, it's a very um, highly debated thing, right? Any Anytime uh, you bring financial, um, financial, a financial, financial benefit into anything, it, it serves as a, um, as, as a, as a possible kind of uh, place to falter. And so those are th some things I think, you know, that ADA, ADA does a good job of, but obviously they could all, they could all do better because obviously funding goes into different things and there's different factors, money speaks and, um, you know, really finding the best insulin, not only the best insulin, the lowest lowest cost, the most efficient, the the insulin that lasts the longest, especially for areas that don't have regular refrigeration and so on and so forth. Um, those are all different factors that um, hopefully continue to grow and and hopefully the best kind of evolve from that and, and consensus develops around that. Um, and that's kind of the general hope that we have to have, but we can always do more. So thank you so much for those two great questions. I think we're at the end of the presentation. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I would say if you had any interest in kind of what I said, um, we have free resources here. I would um, please kind of uh, access the guide, share that with other individuals um, if it's of, of, of benefit to you. If there's any way that we can kind of collaborate in any fashion, um, you'll be able to very easily find our social media. With that, thank you very much for all of your time today.